How did you get into the military? Were you drafted or did you enlist voluntarily? Tay manu na umalumo gisip bisyo ko madrafo gina tempo jan na yan na umalumo but no bumalentario did you volunteer or stuff like that? So let's let's start with that. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I graduated from uh, George Washington Senior High School in May of 1969. And in 1969, there was still a draft going on because of the Vietnam War. And I turned 18 years old on May 17th of 1969. And so I was working at the Agania Post Office. And the postmaster said, uh, that I could continue working there full time, but I was afraid that if I started working there, that the draft would catch up with me. And of course, back then, when you get drafted, you had no choice what branch in the military to go in. So rather than taking a chance for the draft to catch up with me, I volunteered for three years so that I could pick the branch that I wanted to go in and the job that I wanted to do. So I enlisted for three years rather than waiting for the draft. But you had uh, this inkling to actually join the military, uh, but not necessarily to stave off the draft that was happening at that time during the Vietnam War. So, but you, you really wanted to go into the military anyway, or, or is that it? Or this is just like you were being forced to do this just to um, well, get away from the draft? Well, I know I knew that I needed to do my military obligation. And like I said, with the draft, it's a two year obligation, but then you don't know what branch of service you were going into. Back, actually, when you got drafted, you're either going into the army or the Marines. They're not gonna send you to the Navy. They're not gonna send you to the Air Force or the Coast Guard because they have it easy. <laughs> and the draft, they need people to go out and fight the war, you know, build the numbers. So I took a gamble with the additional one year, uh, making it three years obligation. But like I said, I figured that with me taking an extra year, I can choose the branch that I wanted to go in, which actually was the Air Force, not the Army. But the Air Force at that time had a six month waiting list to go into basic training. And I said, I, I don't want to wait six months. I need to go in and get this over with. You know, so the army said, yeah, come on in, enlist. And uh, two weeks later, after I enlisted, I was off to basic training. So yep. I yeah. just needed to get my yeah. military obligation out of the way. That was normal there, but you jumped ahead of everything else. And like you said, you cannot evade the the draft that was happening at that time. No, um, not at that time. But but, but you know certainly there were other types of uh, jobs maybe that will actually put you in a different uh, you know to get exempted from the draft and you chose not to you wanted to go in there and do your obligation and I'm so happy that the thing that came to your mind was your obligation your duty to our nation our great nation and uh, our right. Guam people you know and uh, yeah, certainly during you know, that time everybody had this feeling like yeah i want to go and join the military and you know contribute myself to uh, uh the war that's going on there but yeah that's great um so the motivation was there and you already yeah see you already answered number two here um and you went into the army how 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 did that feel just going into the army where in actuality you wanted to go into more technical type of training uh, hence you were looking at the air force but you want to go into more technical type of training and education. Well, yeah, the, well, the Army offered me the school and uh, they guaranteed me the electronic school, which you and I went to at Fort Sioux, Oklahoma. That was a field radio mechanic course. They call it pharmacy. And so they guaranteed the school, but they didn't guarantee that you would graduate from the school. It was up to you to apply yourself to the course that you were taking, you know, cause not everybody was good in electronics. And so I made sure that when I was in AIT that uh, I, I knew my job and then I learned how to read schematics, electronic schematics. 
uh, how to take uh, measurements of resistors, transistors, um, how to install and troubleshoot the uh, communication equipment. So uh, I apply myself. And not only that, but after I, I finished AIT, they kept me over for an additional three more weeks. And I actually became a um, film artillery digital automatic computer repairman at yeah. that time called FADEC. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember FADEC. Yeah. And so yeah. computers were very new at that time, and, and especially for artillery units, you know, because the computer computed the fire missions. And they would tell you, depending on the distance of the, of the target uh, and the type of target, whether it was soft target or hard target, what type of uh, ammunition to use and what, uh, how many charges to put in the gun. And so the computer, at that time in 1969 was a, a new concept, but I wanted electronics. I wanted to do something with electronics and that's why I chose the army. Yeah, well, the military did invent the internet and uh, all these computer things that were happening. <laughs> that's hearsay, but uh, yeah, I, I, I tend to believe it because I, I was there uh, and this thing was just so intriguing. Uh, you know, where you just punch in the azimuth and distance and all this stuff and stick it in there and, and, and the, right. the little can and they will just fire and it will be right on target with very, a mile away or three miles or 20 miles away. So it was very, very intriguing to me. Yeah, um, yeah so that's, that's fine. Field artillery, yeah. Um, let's back up just a little bit. When you left the island uh, uh, two weeks after you enlisted and you, you went like this, you know, you, you soared in and you went down yeah. there got your haircut you got your papers and everything else uh where did you receive your basic training uh, well i left guam and flew to travis air force base california yeah. this was the first time in my entire life that i've ever been on a plane you know uh, long flight i got actually air sick and i threw up in the plane you know they have like in front of the the seat in front of you, they got those bags. <laughs> I used those bags <laughs> yeah, yeah. because when we got ready yeah. to land at Travis, you know, with the the plane was the was like coming straight down, and of course the, the plane's coming straight down, and your stomach's way up there on the ceiling. So that was a weird feeling at all, but uh, that was a long flight too, you know. So mm -hmm. it it was a uh, it was an experience, and so when we landed at Travis Air Force Base. They had to bus us down to Fort Ord, which is down in Monterey, California. And that's about maybe a three, four hour drive on bus. So, and then it was like chilly there because the temperature was like in the seventies. And so I spent three days at reception center and they got issued our uniforms, our dog tags. We had a private first class at the reception center that taught us how to make our bunks. And then the very next morning, Everybody had to shave. Now, I had never shaved in my life. I still had peach fuzz. <laughs> so the, first that, the, first that, yeah, the first time that I shaved, I think I took a, a part of my skin off my face. <laughs> but, and then they, uh, after we got all our uh, a testing done, our immunization, whatever uh, uh, shots we didn't get in Guam. We got all our equipment, our uniform. Then they transported us by a uh, cattle truck over to our uh, basic training company. And I was in uh, C23, uh, Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Brigade. And uh, that was my home for the next, gosh, 12 weeks, basic training then, and uh, qualified with an M14 rifle. And that was hard. Basic training was hard. You know, other than the fact that you got sick of the plane, along on the anokko na flighty gibat ko nai rin, Other than oh, that, yeah. what, else, what else stood out? Uh, you know, being in a very strange place, uh, where we were acclimated to these places by watching black and white TV at home. Say, hey, that's the states, and uh, you know, where's the Lone Ranger and Tonto and and things like that. And it wasn't like that at all, actually, when you when you got there. And I'm glad that you mentioned no. the term cattle 
truck or cattle. <laughs> you know, yeah, the cattle truck. Yeah, was there? Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, we were there looking out. You know, uh, like this, and uh, you know, it was just good times. You know, but what was your feeling? Uh, did you get homesick right away? Like, what am I doing here? I want to go back home. Or oh yes, definitely. <laughs> Definitely, I got I got home, so that's the first time in my life, man, I've been away from home, you know. Uh, the food was not like the food that mom cooked at home. This was all oh. new type of food. And then when you went, when you went to the, the, the mess hall, they call it mess hall at that time, now they call it dining hall. When you went to the mess hall, you had to stand at attention. And then the uh, sergeant that was on, uh, uh, they call that uh, duty roster, would mm -hmm. say, give me five. And then, mm -hmm. you, you you know, if you were parade ready, you snap to attention and you kind of one, two, three, four, five. And you go up there and you sign. And then, oh, I forgot. You had to sound off with your uh, serial number. Like if you said RA, which, which stands for regular army, would always be like on your case if you were regular army because, oh, you enlisted in my army. Yeah. What are you going to do in my army, you know? And like the, the exact, a draft D, oh, you had to get drafted to come in the service. You know, you didn't volunteer. So whatever, whatever your, your uh, category was, there was no winning anything. You know, the, the, yeah, the you, drills you are you can't win it. You that time. They're slightly as uh, strict, more strict than uh, in today's army, if you will. But we could discuss that later yeah. on. But uh, yeah, so the uh, mess hall was right next to the latrine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was like, whoa, you don't do that kind of stuff, not even in Guam. But uh, you know, be that as it may, it was kind of, kind of fun. It was a brand new experience being a young man. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's uh, uh, other than, like I said, uh, you getting sick on the plane and uh, going up there. And it was like only today, right? Uh, Sergeant Muffness, when you were there and uh, you looked around and there's 62 Chamorros that volunteered or enlisted or whatever got drafted and uh, it was just amazing that kind of feeling um but other than getting well, sick we, we actually and, had uh, quite a few people. uh Shimoros in our in our unit you know hmm. and a matter of fact the the senior drill sergeant was filipino drill sergeant to hood i don't know oh, you remember sergeant to hood that little short yeah. guy uh, the e7 was, uh, really real really short tough. guy yeah Tough guy. Yeah. Yeah. he was a tough guy i i remember I, my my bag was up on the third floor and we had these red uh one gallon cans and had water in it so that when the soldier would smoke they would throw the cigarette in there to put the cigarette out and we had a barracks inspection and he walked down the center of the bay the open bay and he just started kicking in those those cans water splashed all over the place of course you, you know who ended up cleaning it right we had a, an inspection and he turned over the, the foot lockers. If you saw someone in your foot locker, it turn it over and don't get caught with any kind of contraband in your wall locker because we had this mm -hmm. one guy had cookies. I guess he got it from home, home package and they put it in his wall locker. Oh my God, he just take that wall locker and threw it down on the floor. So yeah, they scared the heck out of you in basic training. <laughs> And they'll stick you in a barracks or something like eighty year old barracks you know that was uh, made that was uh, was that was uh, built back in nineteen oh one or eighteen ninety five or whatever those wooden barracks uh, but i I think we got it lucky well yeah that was a the reception concrete. center yeah yeah fantastic yeah but our barracks was the con the uh the block the center block uh, barracks three stories high so we got the new barracks, but it was a pain being up on the third floor because when they blew the whistle and you have to run out to the company street for formation and you're up on the third floor and the guys on the second floor hasn't gotten out yet, you got one heck of a traffic jam on the stairway. It seems like I a rasp. I remember getting, in, getting into a fight. Yeah, it seems like oh, a yeah, rasp. It's a rasp, definitely. More severe, but I think it's all part yeah. of the plan to yeah. condition you. That's a tough soldier. Yeah, they blow the whistle. You, you, you run out there again in formation. Man, I yeah, that was definitely a har harassment. And you know, a private first class back in those days, he was God, man, the, the private first yeah. class. And I said, man, I want to, I can't wait to be a private first class. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> they had, they had uh, a lot of, of cool, 
A lot of authority. Yeah. Yeah. Remember those days when, when for the sake of harassment, they come in at three o'clock in the morning and they'll tell you to take your duffel bag and all your belongings and throw it out the window. And then they'll tell you to go downstairs and pick it all up. Uh, yeah, that, that happened yeah. to our site on our, our uh, you know, it's just kind of like crazy. But like I said, I think that type of harassment, which is unheard of today, I think, uh, was a uh, was all part of it to make you be a man, uh, if you will. You know, at that time, we want tough soldiers in here. So, you know. Okay, my next question, John. Uh, well, they put you under stress. stress. Yeah. yeah. Say, and they teach you how again. to deal with it, I guess. Yeah. And they teach oh, yeah. you how to deal with the stress that's coming your way. Um, yeah. Let's, let's just move a little bit forward after your AIT training. Um, for civil platform, and uh, we're held back three, three more months or three more weeks or, or whatever for further training. Mm -hmm. Or uh, weeks, you know, yeah. for the FADEC uh, that was there, yeah. But but thereafter, did you go straight to Vietnam? Uh, uh, you were you were in combat right after that. Did they send you to Vietnam right away after AIT? No, uh, <clears throat> no. I actually uh, I went back to Guam on leave, and I only spent I think two weeks in Guam, and then I uh, flew to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. My uncle was stationed there. He was a staff sergeant at the time. And uh, he took me up to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. And uh, from Fort Dix, um, <clears throat> the Sergeant E5, we were in line and he said, okay, from here to here, you guys go back to the barracks and put your fatigues on because you got KP. I said, oh no, kitchen police. And I, I hated that duty. Well, the dining hall <laughs> in uh, Fort Dix was open 24 hours a day because mm -hmm. we had soldiers coming in from Germany and we had soldiers coming in from Vietnam and then guys going from uh, Germany to Vietnam or from Vietnam to Germany. So uh, I was on KP like around nine o'clock that morning to about nine o'clock that evening. Oh. And the same Sergeant that took us uh, to, the, to the dining hall for KP, he came back at nine o'clock in the evening and said, all you soldiers, go back to the barracks, get your class A uniform on because you're flying out tonight, you're going to Germany. Uh, flying out tonight meant like it's like two o'clock in the morning. And I'll never forget the, the name of the airline. It was called Jupiter Airlines. Oh, yeah. So it was funny because <laughs> we flew from uh, uh, McGuire Air Force Base. It was a military airlift command flight and flew into Frankfurt to the reception center. So then they bust us over to the, the uh, replacement uh, center, or the, the concern. And we're standing in formation and there's snow on the ground and we're all in our class of uniform. And then again, the sergeant comes and says, okay, from here to here, you, you guys can go put your fatigues on because you got KP. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> I was in Fort Dix, New Jersey. I was on KP. I come over to Germany and the first thing they do is put me back on KP. I said, what, what kind of deal was this, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> that was an experience. What were you doing in Phil Belver, Virginia? What were you doing there? I mean, was it a more specialized training uh, as you went along? Or, no, or my, that my uh, uncle, uh, Antonio Titanfong, um, was stationed there. And uh, he worked at Davidson Army Airfield. That's where they keep the president's oh. helicopter at. Oh, okay, okay. So, gotcha. You just went there for a visit. Then. You know, I. That's what you did. Yeah, just a visit. You know, and so, uh, like I said, he and his family drove me up to Fort Dix, New Jersey. So then I, I in process there for my flight going to uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I got up there, and the first thing I did, they put me on KP, and then I got to Germany, and the first thing they do is put me on KP. So I was eager to get to my unit. My, my permanent duties uh, station. So I got to Germany, it was in January of 1970. So I was assigned to, to a Bravo company, first of the 35th Armor, which is part of the 4th Armor Division. And I was stationed in a, a town called Erlangen. And Erlangen is about maybe 20 clicks, about 60 miles from, uh, or 12 miles from uh, Nuremberg. Uh, Nuremberg was south of us. And okay. uh, you probably heard of the, the Nuremberg trials, you know? 
Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's how far we were. were. Yeah. Post World War II trials. Yeah. yeah. But so I was assigned you... to a tank company. Yeah. That's interesting. A tank company. Uh, so the armored division and uh, your specialty, if you yeah. will, based on your AIT was uh, cannons, you know, missiles and stuff like this. So that's just interesting. But, you know, then you're in the service, so they'll put you wherever they feel that they need you. So how long was your stint yeah. over in Germany? Well, I was there for eight months. Like I said, I got there in January. And then I was out in the field in Grafenbeer. And my unit, we were doing what they call tank gunnery. Wait. So my first sergeant showed up. And uh, I was fixing helmets for the tankers. They're called the uh, combat vehicle uh, helmets, CVC helmets. And I was in the back of my mm -hmm. armored person mm -hmm. I carried. Now, I this was one. And so I was fixing, the ramp was down on the APC. And the first sergeant says, Mofness. I said, yes, first sergeant. He says, go get you your stuff because you're going to the NAM. And he always kidded me about going to Vietnam because he would say, you look like a gook. And I said, first sergeant, what is a gook? I said, you know when you get to Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> you find out enough, right? Yeah, but but you know, a gook in is a French word which means foreigner, you know, and mm. actually that's what we call the Vietnamese over in Vietnam. We call them gooks. When in reality, we the soldiers, or the outsiders, were the gook because we're the foreigners. We're the you know, we're in yes. their country. You know, but anyway, uh, he came back 15 minutes later. I said, Mofnas, didn't I tell you to go get your stuff? I said, you got three days to all process. You're going to Vietnam. I said, first time, are you for real? He said, yes. That's why I came out here to get you. I just told your sergeant, Sergeant Keeling, my uh, NCYC was an E5. So I went to my sergeant. He said, Sergeant, who's going to fix them helmets? He said, don't worry about it. <laughs> go get your stuff, man. You got three days to all process. I said, holy smoke. So sure enough, the, the entire battalion was up in Grafenbeer. So the first arm took me back in his Jeep and we went back to our home base. And we had to sleep up in the attic because all the rest of the barracks was, was locked up, you know, because everybody was in the field. So sure enough, I had to all process, got my clearance, and then uh, I went down to Frankfurt in my Class A uniform. and. Uh, they put me on a plane. It was a uh, TWA. I call it Teeny Weeny Airlines. <laughs> TWA was still flying back in the days. You know? And so I was flying from Frankfurt to to Seattle, Tacoma, and I had to go to Fort Lewis, Washington, for two weeks RVM training. Now mm -hmm. I said I qualified with an M14 rifle. I had to go there and learn, you know, how to patrol and learn, and and then qualify with an M16 rifle. So that, that I spent was a two weeks there right? at uh, Fort Lewis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, orientation. And we did like an air mobile operations there where we, uh, they put us up on helicopters. And man, I tell you, they had us sitting on the side of the chopper, the UH-1, with our feet on the skid. And I'm thinking, oh man, this thing start to fly and start tilting. No, we're going to be falling right out of it, right? But no, mm -hmm. the, the inertia as the, as the chopper's moving will keep you in. You're not going to fall out. But anyway, uh, I asked for leave, and uh, they gave me 30 days delay route leave, which is great because from uh, Fort Lewis, I went to Oakland Army Base. I spent two days there, and they finally put me on a plane, a Mack flight, to uh, Anderson Air Force Base. And then I, I was in Guam for uh, 30 days uh, delay route leave before I went to Vietnam. So... That was the only good thing about actually going to Vietnam is was I get to go home and you know spend 30 days in Guam, where when you were, if I didn't have when you were that, in uh, in Grafenbeer, uh, was that during the winter training or the summer training or spring training? That was a summer. That was summer training. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. All, Germany, where I was at, we had a lot of snow, and so I used up all my uh, TA50 gear. I used my uh, my field pants with the liner. My Parker with a liner, the field jacket with the liner. I mean, I look like a abominable snowman walking around, you know. 
with all the clothes I had on. Long johns and all that. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, the the LJs because I wasn't used to the cold weather, you know. Like I said, first time being away from home. So, but yeah, uh, Germany was great. They had the discotheques downtown. You know, we went oh, there yeah. and of course. when you're off on the weekends and we were getting um, uh, exchange rate for every $1, you get four marks. And that back uh -huh. then, that was a lot of money. That was a yeah. lot of money. It's not that way now. Yeah, now they got the, the Euro. But yeah, so I love Germany. Yeah, well, what did you achieve by that time when you were in E2 already or did you finally get to your PFC status when you were in Germany? Uh, I, in Germany, I got there as a PV2, uh, mm. private E2. And then uh, less than a month, uh, they had a, a PFC board. I had to go to the, the headquarters, the uh, battalion headquarters, and they had a sergeant major who was the president of the board, his first sergeant. And so they had like five slots for a private first class. And I had to go in front of the board and uh, they ask you all these questions and stuff like that, chain of command about map reading and land navigation, things like this, general military knowledge, drill and ceremonies. And so uh, out of the, I think 10 of us that went, five of us got private first class. So I made private first class faster than I made private E2. Cause I got my private E2 when we were in AIT at Fort Seal. Then mm -hmm. uh, about two months later, they had another promotion for spec four. And so my uh, first sergeant put me up for that cause I had, I had gone and made uh, soldier of the month uh, when I was there. And then you had uh, what they call guard mount. When you go, when you're selected for a guard duty, uh, uh -huh. they have a guard mount and then the uh, officer of the day would inspect you. And so the, my very first time I asked this, uh, private first class next to me from my unit I said, man, what's this guy doing? He said, oh, he's going to inspect everybody and he's going to pick one soldier, one numera, super numera, and then he doesn't have to pull guard. I said, he doesn't. I said, no. I said, well, what's he looking for? I said, he's looking for your uniform appearance and your general military knowledge, like uh, your uh, general orders for guard duty, you know? Uh, so the very next time that I had uh, post guard again, I made sure that my boots were spit shine. My, my uniform was like heavily starched. And we wore the, the, um, the yellow ascot because we were in a uh, armor unit. So that looked mm -hmm. nice in the uniform. So the next time we went out there and uh, I challenged the officer of the, uh, of the day. And so he called me over and he asked me all these questions and stuff like that. I think uh, out of the questions that he asked me, I'm just maybe two or three. And then said, okay, you got super numerous. So go report to the sergeant major. So then I had to go to the battalion headquarters, report to the sergeant major. I said, Sergeant Major, I made super numerous. And said, okay, I says, uh, you can go back to the barracks. He took my name. You can go back to the barracks and change. And says, and you also have a three-day pass coming whenever you want it. Oh, yeah. hello. I said, <laughs> 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 I mean, that was easy, man. <laughs> you just look sharp and, and know your general military knowledge, you know. And, so you, uh, you, and you get out of having a full guard duty. Yeah. So you went into uh, Vietnam from Guam. You went to Vietnam as a specialist E4. That's, that's yeah, what happened. That's spec four. Yeah. Specialist E4. So how, how did the familia yeah. feel about you being uh, shipped over to Vietnam? Uh, no, not, not very good. My, my go mother was very really sick, you know. We had some, I lived in Canada by regard at that time. And uh, some of our neighbors' uh, sons that were in the army had gotten killed in Vietnam. You okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. No, I lost my, uh, keep, keep going, John. Okay. You can see. So uh, my, my mother was worried sick and she would have mass set at uh, our church in uh, Barrigada. And uh, she sent me a, a rosary which I still have to this day. And so I kept that rosy with me uh, in Vietnam. But no, my, my mother was very worried sick about me getting killed over there. And, you know, yeah, she would have gotten, uh, I think back at that time, something like around $20,000. That was a soldier's group life insurance. 
-hmm. but she would rather have me home than to get the money, you know. <laughs> but uh, I was fortunate that I was able to go home twice from Vietnam to for R and R in Guam. Uh, but yeah, uh, that was a that was a weird feeling going to Vietnam. Uh, we landed in Saigon, and the very first night that we were there, we got a rocket attack, and they were firing into the compound. And so the Ooh. bunkers are a little ways from the, the barracks. When you the say barracks, rocket attack, about, you know, the motors, right? Uh, no, these are rockets. Yeah. Uh, the, the rocket, they basically just fire. Those are the motors, and, and right? there's no particular way that it's going to land. It's, it's not very accurate. It all depends on the tra trajectory and which way they fire it. But six uh, rockets landed on the compound. Was this over in no Saigon? Or, yeah, this was in Saigon. Now, this was probably like a, a combat free zone, you know? But the VC, the Viet Cong, was still all over. Yeah. So you just yeah. had to be, be careful. You couldn't go outside the compound. You had to stay in the compound. So we spent two days in Saigon. We got issued uh, an M16 rifle with uh, a bandolier of ammunition. And then uh, we were <clears throat> transferred to our units. And I was assigned at that time. I was traveling all the way up to Fubai. Now, Fubai is way north of uh, Saigon. That's up going towards North Vietnam. Uh, so I was, I was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division, uh, which I'm not airborne qualified, but at that time, the 101st did uh, what I call air mobile. And the operations that we did was with uh, the UH-1 helicopters uh, called air mobile. So we went on a cattle truck and everybody had locked and load M16 rifles, and so we would go to different uh, uh, bases and drop soldiers off depending on where they were assigned to. Well, the very first place that we came to to drop off the first load of soldiers, this one soldier had his weapon uh, with a safety nut on. And so when he jumped off the truck, the weapon went off and he shot himself on the foot. <laughs> this was only like the, the third day he'd been in Vietnam. Oh not, not a good way to start. You know? It's not, not, not a very pleasant way to get going there. But no, you know, like I said, we, we all had weapons, and you know, we had we had a, a round and a, a chamber in the round, because we never know you could you could have been attacked along the route, uh, the main supply route, MSR. Yeah, you, you never know, right? You never know. You never yeah. know. These things. So you just have were to be were, prepared. Were you ever in the thick of things uh, when you talk about combat? Where it's actually fire to fire uh, type of combat uh, in which you had to defend yourself. No, I was, I was not. I was not in, in involved in any kind of patrol where when you went, make contact and you have to shoot at each other. Uh, now I pull a lot of perimeter guard around our compound, and when the sun goes down, it gets a little dark. So then the sergeant of the guard would say, let's fire everything that we have. So we fire, fire Claymore, the M79 launcher. Uh, you fire the M60 machine gun. Uh, we shoot uh, uh, flares. And that was basically just to, number one, do a weapons check. So to make sure that all the weapons were operational. And number mm -hmm. two, anything that was out on, on the wire, outside the wire, you know, if it's there, it's gonna be dead, you know, because mm -hmm. we fire, like I said, the Claymore mines uh, and the M79 launcher. So then you pull guard duty to the very next morning when you get relieved around eight, eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, we had in my unit, we had these night vision devices called starlight scopes. And because me being a, a radio mechanic, uh, my NCOIC, who was a Filipino, his name was uh, Staff Sergeant Matt Morell. He, uh, he gave me the job of taking care of the night vision devices. And so we installed the, the TVS-4, which is the, the big night vision device up on the tower. And uh, that's when one of the guards would be up there. And so mm -hmm. I would get a call like two o'clock in the morning. Hey, uh, Moffness, you need to go out to the perimeter because the night vision device is not working. So of course we had these uh, these mules, 
and it was like a little flatbed car. So then I'd get in one of those mules and drive out to the perimeter because I knew where all the night vision devices were stationed at. And the, the weirdest thing is climbing up on that tower. When you do that at night, you're nothing but a sitting target, you know, but you, you're climbing up the stairs. And so I would get up in there mm -hmm. and the first thing I would do to troubleshoot the night vision device is that I would turn the toggle switch on. And when you turn the toggle switch on, you should hear this humming noise. Well, I put the toggle switch on and there's no humming noise. And I said, I already knew what was the problem. The problem was that the guy that was up there took the battery out. And when he put the battery in, he put it in backwards. So then all, all I did was open up the battery compartment, take the battery, turn it 180 degrees, stick it back in there, put the cover on, hit the toggle switch, and I hear this humming noise. And I said, I know it's, it's working now. Then I let it let it warm up and I look out there and you could see clear as day. It's it's like just a, a green light, you know. But uh, those night vision devices were very uh, they're very helpful for when you're on guard duty or or for the snipers. That's so true. yes. <clears throat> but yeah, we. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the the the, uh, the Vietnam War is it's not like you know when ever you watch tv at that time or maybe even movies now that are being produced concerning war in general um it's never really what you expect when you're right in the thick of things what is the most outstanding thing that you remember uh during that year that you were over in vietnam um any type of very eventful kind of stuff that you will never ever forget kind of thing but you know uh before you you say that before you say anything. I just want to give you kudos, man. You you got quite a memory there, dude. I mean, you know, uh, you know, you, you even remember names and and stuff like this. So wow, Whew. geez, that's uh, that's that's quite a feat uh, for you to remember even names fifty years ago. But going back to the question, what was the most shocking thing, if you will, or most important thing, or most unforgettable thing that has that happened to you while you were over in Vietnam that you will probably never ever forget, um, be it traumatic or uh, something more on the upside or, you know, uh, feel good kind of stuff. It's hard to say I feel good because I went to Vietnam. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm saying is that something might have happened to you while you were there that that you will never it will never leave your mind uh, as long as we're around. Kind of thing. Any anything? Well, there's to there was actually two two events that happened in Vietnam that I'll never forget the rest of my life. The, the first event was when the Buffalo show came over. Uh, I came to Vietnam in October and the Buffalo show came over in December. And that was around the same time that Governor Camacho uh, mm. from Guam came over to, to Vietnam and brought uh, packages from, from home that the uh, you know, loved ones had sent over for their soldiers in Vietnam. And uh, Care package. it was funny because, yeah, it was funny because I remember as a teenager watching the Bob Hope show on TV and uh, never realized that one day I would actually be watching his show in person in Vietnam, you know. And uh, the stars that he brought over for the show was uh, Johnny Bench. He was a, a, a baseball uh, a star. Uh, Gloria Loring. Gloria Loring was a singer and also became a soap opera uh, actress. Um, he had uh, Miss Universe was there. Now her, I forgot her name. And then and then he had uh, the dancers from the Dean Martin show called the Gold Diggers. So uh -huh. yeah, that was something else. Uh, uh -huh. You know, two hours we sat on the on the on the dirt and we watched the show for two hours. And was then, uh, uh, we was, went, uh, was Governor Camacho there with Bob Hope uh, at the same stage, if you will, same platform uh, while he was no, there? No, no. Yeah, they, they came over around the same time. They came over around the same time because my uncle, uh, Antonio Titingfong, was stationed in Da Nang. And uh, I guess he helped host the governor when he came into Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to contact me in my mm -hmm. unit. Uh, up north, and they told me, said, no, he's out in the field. He, he, they, they told me I was out in the fire base, and uh, we didn't actually come back in. 
So uh, he somehow got a helicopter ride up to my base, which was Camp Eagle. And uh, we were coming back from the uh, uh, Bothell show, and we were going back to our compound. And uh, uh, I guess he came over to our orderly room and was asking for me. And then one of the soldiers that knew me comes running over to our barracks and says, hey, Martin, I says, uh, you got somebody looking for you here. I said, who? I said, some staff sergeant. Uh, Fong, something, something Fong. I said, Fong, is Titan Fong? He says, yeah, I think that's the name. So I said, well, let's go. So we went over, sure enough, there was my uncle, man. He had this package with him. I said, man, I, I was trying to contact you, but they told me you were in the field. I said, no, we, we were back in for resupply. So he said, well, here's a package from your mom. He says, we were trying to get you down to Da Nang because the governor was there and uh, they had this big, like, fiesta gathering there. You know, Johnny Sablon and a um, whole bunch of other And I would have loved to, to go down there. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, no, man, I said, we, we just came so back in uh, what was from the, the fire base. So what was the second event that stood out in your mind? Oh, the, the second event was, uh, was very actually very sad because I had gone home to Guam on my uh, first R&R. And I made friends with this uh, Navajo Indian from Arizona, and his name was Alvin Atakai. And uh, one of the things that we did when we worked on the fire base was that we would periodically go out on the, the road leading up to the fire base, and we would conduct mine sweeps. We had what, this, uh, what they call uh, PPS-11, which is a mine sweeper. So, mm -hmm. uh, we, he was on uh, mine sweep duty one day while I was home in Guam on R&R. &R. And uh, when they find the mines, they would mark it with a spray paint. Well, Alvin was now on rest position and the other guys were moving in front of the truck and marking where the, the line mines were at. Well, when the driver swore to miss the, the landmine on the road and then swore back to another direction, the back tires hit the landmine that had, that had marked. Of course, it went off. It threw my friend probably 50 feet up in the air. And when he landed, he landed and hit his head on a, on a rock and he died instantly. So when I got back to my unit from R&R, uh, my friend told me, says, man, the mom says, you know, Alvin's dead, man. I said, what, what do you mean he's dead? I said, what happened? I said, well, he was on mine sweep and they hit a mine. And uh, he, he died from impact when, when, he, when he hit the ground. And uh, I, I went down to the Vietnam Memorial Wall and I found his name and I have the etching from the Vietnam Memorial Wall. And today mm -hmm. I am uh, friends with his sister. His sister still lives in uh, Arizona. And uh, it was on uh, Veterans Day and she posted a picture of her brother. And I said, that's my buddy in Vietnam. And uh, so we instantly became friends. And I said, your, your brother was an outstanding uh, human being. I said, I'm so sorry for your loss. I said, you know, I said, I didn't know that he had, gotten killed after I came back from my my R&R in &R Guam but uh, yeah that's two things and uh, you never forget you never forget uh, you know friends that's like a, that very difficult to forget that but there were um, uh, did you meet other Chamorros over there that were that actually saw combat perhaps maybe in maybe in your same unit or uh, a neighboring unit uh, in which you guys were uh, where you were stationed at in Fubai, uh, were there other people uh, from from Guam there? There were, there were that you quite know a few. Guam? Yeah, there were quite a few Shamoors there. Yeah, there were quite a few Shamoors, and 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 I'm sorry to say this, but the day after I left Vietnam, one of my high school friends who was a uh, crew chief on a UH-1 medevac, David Funes, got killed the day after I left Vietnam. I left Vietnam on a Saturday, and David Funes was flying out to a fire base to retrieve a soldier that had a body that committed suicide. And on the way back, they got shot down. 
So I was but still in knew, Guam when. Uh, what's but that? you knew David. You knew David before. Oh before yes. You, okay. Yeah, David and I were high school uh, classmates. I, I was same with his wife Gloria Herrera, uh, mm -hmm. and Gloria was pregnant mm -hmm. with with their first child when David got killed in Vietnam, and uh, oh. his younger brother was was uh, also stationed there. He was in the three twenty six med uh, medac uh, unit. Uh, here's a picture of some of the the Chamorros that were in in uh, close to my unit. Wow. The only one that are the only one that I remember out of this photo is Saint Nicholas. I forget the names of the other soldiers, but yeah, this this was uh the Shamoas that were uh in my area. Man, I, you know, maybe you could scan that and send it to me. <laughs> oh sure. Yeah. Yeah, Saint Nicholas I remember very well because Saint Nicholas was a mortar man. He he was uh MOS eleven Charlie, and so when he was on a duty, uh, he tell me, he said, hey, Math, I said, come up to, to the, the mortar pit and uh, I'll let you fire some rounds. I said, OK. Uh, so then in the evening, I would go up there. And the way that we would do mortars is that we would fire illumination. And that's what we use to uh, adjust the rounds, you know. So the, uh, the perimeter guard, the sergeant of the guard on the perimeter would call for mortars. and so. We'd fire the uh, illumination first, and then he will, he will give the adjustment, you know, at left, uh, at 50 uh, left or uh, uh, 100 right or whatever the case may be. And then once he was satisfied where the rounds was going to land, then he'd say fire for effect. And then we would lob three rounds. Fire for, fire for effect is three rounds of so, motors. And it was, it was weird because you just take the rounds and you put it, you know, on the end of the, the tube and you drop it and you, you step back because when it, hit, it hits on the bottom, the primer gets hit and then it just goes woof and then it fires the, the mortars. But St. Nicholas was, uh, he was a mortar man, uh, 11 Charlie. But yeah, David Funes, uh, I'll never forget that when, when he got killed because I went to his funeral in Guam and his body was was really badly um, damaged from the crash that he had a closed casket funeral. So, but I was fortunate that I was able to attend his funeral there. Bro. <laughs> just the uh, internet here. But let's just go ahead and continue with this thing. Uh, obviously you had a whole bunch of things that had happened over there. And uh, you know, because of time constraints, I, I think it's very difficult for you to go further and and uh, just recall everything that's been happening over there. But, you know, the, the point is, it's never, it's never fun being in a war, you know, uh, no matter how they rom rom romanticize it as we go along. But um, it's just, you know, so sad about David and your friend. And uh, that, that will hit home, man. Every time you think about it, it's, it's um, very difficult to get a good night's sleep, uh, at least for the first few months after learning about things like that, uh, especially if you know the person, um, you know, uh, cl close friends with that person. So it's just uh, my heart goes out to their families, of course, uh, at this point in time. But, you know, as we continue on, what, what rank did you achieve while you were in Vietnam? Did you get your E6 over there or your, your hardcore NCO status over there? You know, I made uh, my uh, Spec 5 at that time because of my MOS, I wasn't a Sergeant Eve, I was a Spec 5, which is the same thing, but the Spec 5, of course, is a specialist in a particular field. And um, about three months before I got ready to uh, de-rolls out of uh, Vietnam, my uh, uh, platoon leader, his name was Lute First Lieutenant Carruthers, he came up to me and says, Mofness, uh, would you like to extend for six more months in Vietnam? And uh, We'll give you staff sergeant. I said, sir, I got three months left in Vietnam. I said, you can take the E6 stripe and stick it, you know where, right? And I, I said, I, I, and I said that, I said, sir, you know, with all due respect, take the E6 stripe and stick it, you know where. I said, I, I actually could have made E6 in under three years in the army, but then I would be oh, gambling yeah. with extending for six more months in Vietnam. And, and just like David, yes. the day after I left, he ended up getting killed. I mean, uh, 
it was a very stressful environment to live in. Uh, you're always under the gun. Uh, you always got to be careful. We actually caught this one Vietnamese uh, that was actually measuring our compound. And uh, luckily, one of the sergeants watched him. And uh, this guy was like walking, you know, counting his steps and then writing something on paper. Well, we come to find out that he was a spy. And I think what he would, they were trying to do was that they were trying to pinpoint where the uh, headquarters was at for the unit. And they were going to try and shoot mortars in there or rockets. Now, the rockets are normally are not that accurate. But when they shoot the mortars, then they're aiming for a particular target. You know, but uh, but yeah, we called this guy in the compound, and because we had some of the Vietnamese would come in and work in the compound, and some of them work in uh, in the dining hall, some of them had uh, the the laundry there, and uh, and then some of them uh, they would work with one of the soldiers, and they would go and take the uh, clean out the latrines, and the latrines had this 55 gallon drum that was cut a quarter off. And then they, of course, that was part of the, the latrine. And they would take that up to the hill, pour diesel in it, and, uh, you know, mix it all up and then burn it. Now, the only job that I really enjoyed doing when I was in Vietnam was being a courier. And that meant that uh, I carried a, a 45 caliber pistol, a shoulder holster, and then I would go over to the S2 and get uh, classified documents. And then I would go to the S1 and get the mail. And then I would go up on a helipad, wait for a chopper uh, that's gonna do a supply run. And then we'd load up the chopper with, with uh, cases of sea rations. I get on there and then we'd fly. And this guy would like crazy, would like be flying down on the, into the river, you know, like making all these different turns. Like I said, you can't pull up because the inertia keeps you in the chopper. Um, and then we would find um, a patrol location and just hover over them and start kicking cases of uh, sea rations out for them, for their resupply. And then like uh, uh, five gallon containers of water and throw that out. And then we would fly to the fire base. Now I, I would get stuck in the fire base for a couple of hours because then the choppers are making the, the resupply runs and then coming back. But I would take out the, uh, the CEO ice that had the frequencies and call signs for the radios, and then uh, mail for the soldiers that were out on the fire base. And then uh, while I'm there, I'd help them uh, reinforce the bunkers. You know, we put dirt into the sandbags and then uh, reinforce the, the bunkers and the places or firing points. So like I said, I would usually end up being out there for like at least uh, two or three hours. And then the chopper would come by and then uh, pick me up and take me back to the rear. So I like that because when we're flying, I mean, you can really see Vietnam really good. You know, it's a beautiful country. But when you're looking out and you see where all the, the B-52s from Guam had dropped their bombs and you see nothing but craters, one, one yeah. crater after crater. And, said, yeah. and, uh, and I used to watch those B-52s leave Anderson Air Force Base, going south to Vietnam, do their bomb raids when I was still in high school. But you have to see that, and then, and then for me thinking, it's just, wow, I get paid to do this. <laughs> Flying in a helicopter, of course, you know, you never know, you might get shot down. Yeah. And I actually, uh, I wanted to be a door gunner, and I applied to be a door gunner. But, but they said that if, if you're a door gunner, the highest rank you can get is E4. And I said, oh, no, no I want to try and make my E5 before I leave Vietnam, which I did. You know, I was fortunate to do that. John, it's, the, you know, uh, so when you got out of Vietnam, for this things that were happening around you and uh, seeing and knowing people that have passed away, I guess, because of the, you know, tragedies of war, did you ever see any type of combat where you at least observation of somebody, um, you know, um, getting shut up? and, and and, and stuff like this. No, I, I was fortunate. I, I was not. I was fortunate that I didn't see something like that because seeing somebody get shot. I mean, I did see somebody get shot down in Da Nang. Uh, 
when I, when I was on my way out, uh, out of Vietnam, but uh, that's something that will be ingrained in your mind forever. And uh, yeah. my friend, I'm not, I'm Alvin Atikai, uh, you know, was the only one that, that I really uh, uh, hit close to home, him and David, because I knew them personally. Uh, I, I wish I would have been able to attend Alvin's uh, funeral. And my, uh, my goal is one day to travel to Arizona and visit his uh, gravesite. Uh, that's that's one of my goals, uh, David. I, I should have I should have went and and uh, visited David's gravesite when I was home in Guam in uh, 2016. Uh, when I retired from teaching, I took a four week vacation and uh, we my wife and I spent two weeks in Guam, and then we went to Hawaii for a week and then to San Diego for a week. And I, I should have it. It wasn't in my plan, but I I should have went and uh, to David's grave and uh, visited his grave. Well, you know, yeah, well, yeah. you know, time goes on and there'll be other times, but you know, sometimes when you, especially if you come back to Guam, you have a lot of time going around doing things and everything. You never have enough no, you, time. You never have you enough home. time. No, you never. It could be two months. You still don't have time. So yeah. that's natural. But uh, let me just uh, go a little bit further. Uh, so you got out of Vietnam. Did you say October? Uh, of 1970? It's October uh, 71. 71 yeah, that you October got 71. out of Vietnam. Yeah. yeah. Was, was there indication of the war over there in Vietnam? I know that, uh, you know, the fall of Saigon happened four years later, but was there any type of indication that the war was coming to an end maybe at the same time that you were getting ready to head out of there and come back home? Not really. Not really because um, we went uh, just before I left Vietnam, we went, we went up north to uh, a village called Quan Tree. Quan Tree is right close to the DMZ that separates North and South Vietnam. We did an operation up there called Lam Song 719. And one of our fire base, fire base O'Reilly, was overrun by the North Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese Army, MVA. And uh, a lot of soldiers got killed there. Uh, fortunately, uh, we weren't real close to that area. Uh, otherwise, we would have provided support. Uh, I don't know if I, I don't think I wrote the picture up with me from when we were there in Quantry. No, it's downstairs. Okay. But, uh, That's okay. But this, this, this is what our. This is what our barracks look like and uh, the bunkers. Whoa. Uh, we is have to appear. Yes, that's me. Yeah, you had hair. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I had plenty of hair back then. <laughs> Matter of fact, there's a picture of me when I was getting ready to, to go home on R&R. &R. Hello, one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like that uh, Air 101 patch that you have there in your left arm. Uh, yeah, fantastic. our patch was was not subdued. Uh, the 101st, we wore the color patch on our jungle fatigues, jungle uniform. So, but yeah, I was getting ready to go home on R&R, &R and uh, this uh, Vietnamese guy, I call him Papa San, uh, came up and he said, you souvenir me the uniform i said yes you can have it because i was going to change into my uh khakis you know my khaki uniform keep going John. keep yeah. going so I, I was in uh benoit and that's where i had to catch my uh r and r flight so i said well let me go i said let me go to the bathroom and i'll go put my khakis you know uh, uniform on and then i come back and i souvenir you this so sure enough, he was still waiting for me when I uh, got back. But uh, yeah, we flew from Benoit to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. And then from there, of course, it was only about a three hour flight from Clark to uh, Guam. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that was the R&R &R mm -hmm. flight. And then that flight landed at Anderson. And then uh, it flew from Anderson to Honolulu. And it's funny because seven days later, the same guys I was with on the plane were the same guys that landed in Anderson picking me up 
So we can go to Clark and then pick up passengers in Clark and then back to uh, uh, Benoit. So, wow. I mean, that was great. But I'll tell you what, that seven days went by really fast. Mm -hmm. You know, let's just, just uh, fast forward. You, you, you got out of Vietnam, of course. Uh, you, you came back to Guam, right? Uh, yes. Uh, before you were heading to, a, before you headed to your next duty station, until you now got to go to Lugat. And uh, how did you feel when you landed on Guam? How the reception, the reception from the familia and everything? It was like a, whew, I made it kind of thing. Yes. Uh, you know, it was going through your mind. And I'm very my, sure, mom. My, was, Mom was yeah, like, oh, my mother was right very, there. oh my God, my mother was uh, was very happy. Then uh, I got out of there without a scratch, you know. Well, really, I I didn't leave Vietnam without a scratch because we were watching. Uh, we have a, an, an open theater. We were watching a movie one time. It was called Kelly's Heroes. Oh, and somewhere in the middle of the movie, you ever hear that movie? Yeah, Kelly's Kelly Savalas and Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Down in Sutherland, yes. Yeah. So we were walking, right? And it's like, say, it's an open theater, and we had these railroad ties that we sat on. And right when there was like thunder and lightning in the movie, there was this blue flash behind the open theater. And then, like, the ground just shook. I said, oh, crap. <laughs> we're being rocketed <laughs> so that everybody wow. started scattering and it was raining that night too i mean, I'll never forget that because we had our poncho on and uh, trying to keep the rain off and uh it was raining so when that went off everybody saw it, took off different places we have a trench and in the trench that's also where you can hide instead of going to the bunker i just dove into the trench and the trench is lined with the uh, psp it's like these these metal uh, sections that they use to make um, airports for landing for the planes. Oh, okay. Well, when I went diving in there, of course, I scraped my face, and I didn't care as long as I, I got into the the pit. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. my my face was all bloody and everything. So yeah, that was my only scratch that I had in Vietnam, luckily, but uh, the scratches went away eventually. But I'm glad I was, you know, got out of there alive. But yes, you know, uh, coming back my home, mother. Say again? You know, just coming back home, and the reason why I was asking you that is a uh, direct contrast to some of our boys and uh, maybe even girls that went to Vietnam and going back home in the States uh, where the reception was uh, kind of like cold uh, because of them being in the war and they were calling right. them baby killers and yeah. murderers and war mongers and stuff like this so uh you know based on the other veterans that i've interviewed um it wasn't like that at all when they came home to guam it was a totally no, different guam. thing yeah the states was yeah. a different story yeah 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 how did you feel about that uh you know hearing stories from your friends and your buddies that was with you that were with you over in vietnam and then getting that type of reception when they landed over in san francisco or travis or wherever that they they needed to land first and you have these protesters out there with signs saying you know um you know you're no good and uh, stuff like this it just um i i'd like to explore a little bit about how you would probably feel when you were in that situation well you know uh the mentality of the people back then towards the military was different and i think uh one of the things that caused it was the draft. Not a lot of people were, you know, for the draft because you have people that uh, were drafted and they couldn't go to school or in, even they were, if they were in college, if you didn't have passing grades and depending on what uh, your degree was that you're trying to pursue, you could be drafted, you know, they could pull you out of college and, and, and send you into the military. So, mm -hmm. The uh, civilian population back then did not have an appreciation of the military service members because, like you said, they called us baby killers. Uh, we're over there in a war that they were not for, but soldiers don't have uh, any type of political uh, agenda. 
we go there because we have to follow our orders. You know, mm -hmm. regardless of who the president of the United States and what party they belong to. You know, when you raise your right hand and you swear into the military, you say that you, you defend and protect the Constitution of the United States of America and that you obey the orders of the president and the orders of the officers appointed over you according to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So you have to do that. If you don't follow the orders, you're going to end up in jail, you know? In jail. So, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Don't mess around. I mean, anyway, just yeah. moving I mean, right along here. Do you, do you have, this is one of the questions that I wanted to, uh, coming to that point, if you had to start all over, uh, would you again be in the military, sign up for the military, knowing what you know now and your experience? Uh, I, I would definitely uh, enlist again. Uh, the military was not all bad for me. Uh, my only bad experience Actually, my two bad experiences with the military was being in Vietnam. And then when uh, my family and I came uh, back to the States and we were stationed in California, and then I came down on the levee for Korea. I could not take my family to Korea. I had to leave them here in the States for a year. Now, that's one year of my uh, daughter's lives. I had two daughters then that I missed out, you know, and, and I'll never get those no matter how long I live. So, but uh, right towards the end of my three-year enlistment, I uh, met my wife through a blind date, and that was in 1972. And then uh, 1973, we got married uh, right there at Fort Meade, Maryland, my first stateside duty assignment. And so uh, we've been married now for 48 years. Whoa. And, uh, Whoa. You know, is that when you decided to just make uh, uh, the military, the U.S. Army, your career? Because I know that you, you were in, right, for 20, 25, uh, how long have you? 27 you years. In this 27 world? years. 27 years. So that was the, the point where you decided to stay in, maybe when you uh, already, have a, already had a family and, and uh, the things that you were doing. Yes. Uh, I was getting ready to hit close to the 10-year mark. And of course, being in the military, you do 20 years active duty and then you can retire and start receiving a pension. So mm -hmm. I said, you know, let me try and stick it out. If I get promoted, uh, at that time I was a staff sergeant when I was stationed in uh, Fort Meade, Maryland. And uh, we were going over to Germany and I said, let me stick it out. If I get promoted to E7, I can still retire as an E7, you know, with 20 years service. So, uh, when I hit close to that 10 year mark, I said, you know what, let's just go ahead and, and continue going and, and get that 20 year mark and then retire. Uh, I actually retired the first time 24 year service. And uh, three months after I retired, I got recalled back to active duty. And my recall was supposed to be for one year. My one year recall ended up being three years. So, and it was weird because yeah. They forced me to retire at 24 year service. And then three months later, they, they called me back to active duty. And the only bad thing about that was that when they called me back to active duty that I was not considered for any type of promotion. And I actually turned down E9 when I came back from Germany in 89, because I so needed to get my, uh, say again? So what? When you first retired, when you were forced to retire, you were already an E8. E8, yeah, I was E8. Because at that time, they after the Persian Gulf War, they uh, an E8 used to be able to go to 28 year service and then retire. They changed the retention control points, and an E8 then could only go to 24 year service. Or if you were on the sergeant major list, then you can continue. Uh, it's funny because a bandsman. A person that's in the army band, an E8, could have went to 30 year service. But yet myself as a, a communicator could only go to 24 years. You know, it's I, it, it depends were, on your MOS. No one could ever know how that could happen, but be that as it yeah. may, right? There's a couple more yeah. questions, John. Man, this is this is a, your story is fantastic. Uh, uh, it's just something that 
and I will ask you this question. And uh, now that you're a veteran, what kind of advice or message would you give to the young'uns that want to go into the military or about the military? What kind of yeah. advice would you give? I would say if anyone is considering going into the military, I don't care what branch you, you, go, you want to go into, uh, make sure that you think hard about going in the military because the military life is not the same as civilian life. It is a very structured and very strict way of life. Uh, if you're not able to adapt to your surroundings, if you're not able to follow orders, and uh, you may have a lieutenant that is uh, 15, 20 years younger than you, telling you what to do, you know, and you as a, an older person can adjust to that, then, then don't do it because it will get you in trouble. Uh, you got to understand that when you sign that contract to go into the branch of the military and you're sworn in, that you are actually saying that you are prepared to die for your country. And some people don't understand that, you know. Uh, I tell that when I was teaching junior ROTC to my cadets, I would tell them, don't go in the military. If you're going in the military for the college tuition, join the National Guard, you know, or take out a student loan and then go into the military. Because when you go in the military, then some of that money that you receive, you can use to pay it off your uh, student loan. But if the military today is not the same as when I enlisted back in 1969. There's a, there's a lot of different things going on in the military. I don't think the training is as strict. Uh, there's too much of, uh, you gotta tell me why I gotta do this. Whereas before, you do it because you're told by a higher authority. You know, you don't have time to question the orders. The only time that you should disobey an order if it's unlawful, like what happened with Lieutenant William Calley when he told those soldiers mm -hmm. to kill the you know, civilians. Yeah. You know, uh, if I was a soldier in that group, I would refuse to fire, court martial me, because that's an unlawful order to shoot unarmed civilians. You know. And, uh, but you got to make that determination. What's, what's in it for? What, what do you want to get out of the military? Do you just want to be uh, going in for three or four years and then get the benefits? Uh, there's a lot of benefits that veterans are losing you know, daily. Uh, and, and in some places, veterans can't get any assistance whatsoever because they don't have the resources. So depending on where you retire, uh, or where you live, and as a veteran, you got to determine, you know, hey, is this a good place for me to live? Can I get some veterans assistance? You know, you, you got to weigh all those options. Uh, I'm fortunate that with my military retire retirement and with my teacher retirement, that I don't really need assistance from the, the VA. Uh, I used the VA one time, that was when I applied for a home mortgage. And I got the certificate. It was guaranteed at that time in 1992 when we bought our house. It guaranteed my uh, mortgage lender $36,000 that if I default on my mortgage, that the federal government will come in and pay $36,000 towards my mortgage. So, yes, that, well, that's the uh, veteran's certificate for uh, home uh, mortgage home loan but there's a lot of programs that will help out the veterans now as we know it but overall in general there are no regrets of you being in the service at all uh, not no. the opportunities that you took advantage of uh, over these past 28 years I, I guess of your life no uh, I, I have no regret of uh, the military like I said the only two two times that I really had uh, some uh, drawbacks was when I went to Korea for one year and I couldn't bring my family and then the one year I was in Vietnam, because of course, I was a single soldier back then, so it didn't matter, you know. If I got killed, my mother would have gotten $20,000. You know, I'm saying my <laughs> mother and father. Uh, luckily, they, they never had to get that money. Uh, 
my experience in the military, I've been, I've, I've traveled all over the world. I've been to Alaska. I learned to ski in Alaska. I've been to Australia, uh, Korea, uh, stationed at West Point. I've been to Germany three times. Um, travel, like I say, all over the world. Um, my uh, kids, I think they benefited from uh, being in the military because they got to see places where kids in, in, that, that are not in the military only read about in books. But yet my daughters have been there. They've been to England. They've been to Germany. They've been to Holland, you know, uh, throughout the United States, California, New York, uh, Maryland. So I have no regrets. You know, I'm, I was fortunate that I worked for some really good leaders that I would follow into battle any day. So I guess it all depends on your job and the people that you're stationed with. Fantastic, fantastic job. Uh, you know, but I want to thank you again from uh, the bottom of our hearts here with uh, this uh, helping us out in this, uh, uh, you know, the Veterans Project. Um, You're welcome. I, I want to show you my... Project uh, Go ahead. I want to show you a picture of my family. I don't know if you can see this. Oh, wow. Let's see. That's your... That's you, of course. My God, look at all those stripes there at the top and your wife, and uh, those are your son-in-laws and your three uh, daughters. My one son-in-law in the back. The other one is my uh, youngest daughter's boyfriend. This was at the uh, Junior ROTC military ball. And uh, we took a group photo, but uh, yeah, my uh, daughters are all grown up. My wife and I helped all three of them to purchase their house. So they're set, they have their hey, own grandpa house. Yet? There you are are you a grandpa okay. yet? Are you oh, a no, grandpa I, yet? I, I got, I got grandpuppies. I got three grandpuppies. <laughs> <laughs> John, before our appreciation and our love, she just wants to for uh, everything that you've uh, given us. Of course, that's a very big insight as to what you went through, and you know, kudos to your success and uh, everything I else that you strive for when you were in the military. And uh, you know, knowing you on a personal note, I am. Um, you've always been like that you've always had this not fear of authority but you've always had the respect for authority uh which oh, is something you. that we're lacking nowadays uh, even in the military um and you know that's the sad part because it takes away your patriotism um if you will in a nutshell uh yeah. you know and you're right if you're in the military you sign a contract that you are supposed to do what you're told to do uh, provided it's not unlawful uh, but you're right. absolutely right about that. Uh, he, in the tomorrow language, everybody gets ordered around, if you will, by somebody else. It does not matter. Right. It does not matter whether you're a five-star general or maybe even the president of the United States. You know, when you talk about being patriotic to your nation, patriotic to your island, patriotic to the people, your peers and everything else, there's it's it's boundless there, there's no limitations so i think that aside from everything else you giving us an insight of how one should actually live their life um to a certain extent i appreciate that so much okay.